Would you please welcome Josh Wellborn to the pulpit? Am I on? Am I on? Hello. Can you hear me now? How you feeling? I, uh, it's true, I, I did graduate before most of them were born. I'd never had that thought until this moment, so thank you. Uh, just remember, no matter how old, what makes me feel better is that, well, no. No matter how old I get, you'll always be older. Um, <laughs> I, lots of memories in this room. Um, I'm in a Marco Polo group with my former roommates from Evangel too. I was messaging them, so it's a, a bit surreal. I don't know how many of you uh, imagine yourselves up here uh, as an alumnus. I don't know how many of you are preparing for ministry. Uh, I was a media major and uh, sat where you're sitting. Many, um, I think we had chapel every day back then. And, and yes, certainly by April, I, I was using my chapel cuts. <laughs> but sat there, there many uh, weekday mornings wondering what God had for me. And uh, as a student, I couldn't wait for Spring Fling and Harvest Fest um, because I, I, I just wanted to, uh, like, that was my creative expression. Uh, like, we would write skits and be in sketches. I was that guy. Uh, it was very hard for me to be serious back then. Um, and uh, now it's very hard for me to be relaxed because I come to you with a heavy weight. Um, I've given my whole adult life to you. Like, you represent, um, I don't know if you consider, I don't know if you identify with millennials or Gen Z, but you represent the last 20 years of investment for me as a local youth pastor. I was a youth pastor until I was 40. And, and I stuck to youth ministry because it was fun. Um, I liked going to Cedar Point and Worlds of Fun and staying up late and playing video games. Um, there's a sociologist, and I, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, if, you, if, you want the, if you want the citation, come to me afterwards, and I'll be happy to share this with you, because I'll have to look it up. But in 1997, he wrote a book called The Fourth Turning, and, and he was pointing out the unraveling of society. And this is why I have a heavy heart today. Because I've given my life to a generation <laughs> who has taken over a mess. And, and, and I'm going to get inspiring here in a minute. <laughs> can, can we all just put that, put a little foot, put a little, put a little, put a little check mark by inspiring. We'll get to that in just a minute. I, I promise you, I, I want to I leave you inspired. But um, in 1997, he said that if the behavior of the boomers, the Xers, and the millennials continues, millennials were children at that point, he said, um, he said, it's going to lead to a societal unraveling. And, and he said, it's only going to take one crisis to lead to a complete unraveling of society. And he said, if, if cultural trends, looking at just American history, if cultural trends continue, there will, be an, uh, there will be a crisis. And of course, we are hopefully on the tail end of the defining crisis of your adolescence, right? COVID. And um, here's, the, here's the cool thing. In 1997, he didn't have a name for this next generation. Uh, sociologists are calling you guys Gen Z. Uh, if you thought you were a millennial, I'm sorry. You don't get a trophy. Um, he, he, he called you guys an artist generation. Because, and this is, this is not a Christian guy. He's saying it will be, it, it will be in the way, it'll be in the backwash of this unraveling that they will look for inspiration. It'll be in the backwash of this unraveling that they will look inside of themselves to pull out what's inside, what they're feeling, what they're going through, what they, uh, the reflections of what they see in society. And uh, that's what artists are, that's what creatives are. I was in Michigan uh, for most of my ministry. I grew up here in Springfield, uh, couldn't wait to get out of Springfield, went to Evangel, loved my, my five years here. <laughs> uh, changed majors like six times just because I knew God had something for me. I didn't know what. Um, interestingly enough, the people that I've kept in touch with, so if you're wondering about these, these relationships that are so, so important to you today, some of them are still important to me. Uh, I, I was class in 98, so 23 years later, uh, still very important to me. The ones that are closest to me, they're all serving the Lord. 
They're all serving the Lord. There's a few that are not, and I've tried to maintain connection with them, but um, I would encourage you to pour into those relationships, not just the things that are important to your mind, but the things that are important to your heart, the things that God is doing in your life, even for those of you who would say, well, my relationship with God is never going to look like somebody whose first name is Pastor. My relationship with God is never going to look like Dr. Johns or whoever. Name, name your spotlight preacher of the of the month, I would just say continue to listen to what's happening inside of you because I really believe, Here, here's the thing, I'll go back to that secular uh, sociologist one more time. He said that and when these artists, when this artist generation takes over, he called it an awakening. And Dr. Wood, I think of your generation and how long have you been praying for an awakening in America? And how many times have you seen revival and, and moments of awakening? Well, now even the world is looking at you guys saying, we need an awakening. We need an awakening. Serving in Michigan, I I live pretty close to the city of Detroit. If you know anybody from Michigan, got any Michigan people? None. We need to do a better job recruiting up there. Hey, guys. Pahola, anybody? Okay, good, one. (sighs) That was our campground. Um, What city in Michigan? Say it again. Saginaw, yeah. So a little bit, Detroit, similar to Saginaw, uh, experienced a a season of industrial glory, bright shining beacon of the industrial, uh, well, not the industrial revolution, but but just just this wonderful experience in in Detroit uh, in a bygone era. And so you have this unraveling take place as manufacturing moved to other countries and and waiting to see what moves in. And and what did move in to downtown Detroit, the first group, because now if you go downtown Detroit, you'll see uh, the Q line, which is a, it's a light rail system that was paid for, um, I can't think of his name right now, the, the owner of, of uh, Quicken Loans, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, what's his name? It's okay, it'll come to me later, when none of you are around. You see life down there, and you see investment down there, there's a Hard Rock Cafe downtown. But you didn't see that 20 years ago. When I came 20 years ago, you didn't see much of anything. You saw burnout buildings. You saw uh, open drug use. You saw uh, arson. Um, if you're familiar with Eminem and 8 Mile, it just looked like that. And, and then slowly what happened was these artists move in and, and began to take over. A friend of mine's a filmmaker. He moved into this old burnout building, redid all of it. Uh, he, he was a very successful filmmaker, did... Did, did content for uh, National Geographic. For he, he shoots stuff almost weekly for um, Wall Street Journal um, and uh, the other one, Al Jazeera, CNN. And he, he married, a, his wife is an X Games athlete. She's a BMXer. So they built a skate park right downtown Detroit. And what happened was these other artists started showing up. And, and, and so I think of the rebuilding that your generation is going to be responsible for and it feels very heavy because you're going to have to wait for some conventional uh, infighting to go away before you can build what's inside of you and I think of Gen Z and I think of how you've been raised I don't know how many of you were raised with Minecraft but I think of the (laughs) I think of that as like your training ground you know you're building a virtual world but now we need you to build the real world. I I have got some scripture for you here today, and I'm going to go through it rather quickly. Um, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, there was a, there was a societal unraveling that took place in the Old Testament. Um, Those of you that have paid attention in your Old Testament survey, you know the, you know the story. Uh, You've got a series of kings in, uh, in the nation of Israel that are, they're very wicked, and finally God says enough. He sends his prophet Elijah uh, to a king called Ahab, his wife Jezebel. They're sort of the, I mean, they're, they're the most wicked of them all. And Elijah says there's going to be a famine. Like, like there's not going to be any rain. It gets really bad. It's a societal unraveling. You see, morally, they had already unraveled. And all it took was an act of nature, supernatural act of nature, for it just to go totally, totally down the toilet. So things get real, real bad. Like, I remember at the beginning of COVID uh, watching one of those disease movies where 
like society just totally breaks down. And I don't know how many of you watch that. It was Contagion, I think was the name of it. I remember watching Contagion and my 16-year-old son's like, that's how it's going to be in six months. I told you. I told you to stock up on rice and water. And we're like, oh, no, no. And here it is a year later. And I'm like, oh, it wasn't as bad as Matt Damon made it look. And, uh, but that's what's happening in the Old Testament is things are getting really bad. God is providing for Elijah. Uh, again, so many of you know this story. Uh, God sends his prophet to the brook Cherith, sends him ravens, sends him water, but then that goes away. See, the title of this message is, you go first and I will say yes. And so when I talk to Gen Z, when I'm talking to you and, and, and imagining myself in those seats and imagining the journey that I've been on, shouldering the burden of my generation, I hope that you'll shoulder shoulder the burden of your generation. Here's the thing, in many ways, the things that you see challenging about the next 20 years are going to be way easier than you think. The things that you see as no-brainers are going to be the solutions that society needs. The heroes of your generation that you've looked up to, I know my teenagers, they look to people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, and they go, ooh, we could do it like that. I'm like, maybe, maybe, or maybe the solutions that you bring are just as natural as Elon saying, hey, I'm going to start PayPal. Hey, we're going to build a society on Mars, and how do we get there, right? Sorry, I'm so sniffly. I started weeping during the thing. I don't know why. I don't know if any of you are like that. I'm not really a weeper. First Kings chapter 17, things are bad. Food runs out for Elijah. But Elijah operates on this premise that I want you to take away, and I want you to remember it. He operates on this premise of just saying to God, God, you go first, and I will say yes. When he went to Ahab to take the message, he said, God, you go first, I'll just say yes. Whatever the question is, I'll say yes, God. Go to the brook Cherith. Okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's out in the middle of nowhere. No one's going to find me. I don't know what I'm going to eat. I don't know how I'm going to be provided for. Just say yes, no problem. God provided. Now God's saying, I need you to go somewhere else. We're going to pick up 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Go and live in the village at Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. A widow? God, you want a widow to take care of me? Yeah, and not only that, she's got a son. A single mom widow? Like, shouldn't somebody else be taking care of my needs, God? So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw the widow gathering sticks. He asked her, would you please bring me some water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called out to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I only have a handful of flour left in a jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of a jug. I was getting ready to, I was gathering a few sticks to cook the last meal and then my son and I will die. It's societal breakdown. Like the unraveling has taken place and he's looking at the apocalypse. It wasn't, but if that happened in today's age, we would all think it's the end. We can't picture it as bad as they had it in that moment. And he's saying to this poor little lady who's a single mom, her husband is gone, maybe he was a victim of the drought, Maybe he was killed violently by a group of gang members that were just trying to scrape together food for their family. We don't know what happened to him. He's gone. And this is the least likely candidate in the city to provide for the man of God. But Elijah says, okay, yes. Now it's her turn. Now it's her turn. What's she going to say? What's she going to do? My dad's in the room. He used to preach this message and he would, or from this text. And he would say it this way. She could have pointed to the empty fields and said, Prophet, it hasn't rained in three years. We used to grow wheat over there and we would collect it. We'd make bread. Do you want me to make some bread from the dusty field? How about a mud pie, Elijah? She could have pointed to the dried up riverbed where they used to catch fish. Say, Prophet, give me a break. There's no food left. She could have pointed to the empty shelves at the grocery store and say, or or the local market, let's contextualize it, the biblical studies majors in the room. (laughs) She could have pointed 
to the empty jars in the market that used to be filled with all kinds of spices from all over the world. Nobody's coming to Zarephath anymore to trade. The merchants stopped coming here a long time ago. And what is left costs more than your life, Elijah. How do you expect me to feed you? Listen, had she said no in that moment? You see, sometimes we say no to God and we say yes to death. I mean, that's what she was saying. She's saying, I'm, are you kidding me? My son and I are getting ready to eat our last meal, then we're going to die. How many times spiritually have we said, God, I know what you're asking me to do. I know what you're calling me to do. And I just can't do it right now. I'm going to go do this other thing that I've already got in mind, the natural thing, the thing that makes just a little bit of sense. And then I'm going to die. <sighs> can't give to support a missionary. Are you kidding me? I'm a college student. You know what kind of student loans are waiting for me on the back end of this? And those millennials that are out there in the workplace are telling me my degree doesn't mean anything? Are you for real? By the way, if that's the trend, then that means your degree is going to be even more valuable. Because you got a whole generation of people going, what's it for? What am I going to do with it? You want to be the purple cow? You want to stand out? Talking to the marketing majors for just a moment. You want to stand out? Walk in with a college degree. You say, you go first, and I'll say yes. So three thoughts, and I'm not going to drag this out super long. But what are we saying yes to? Like I said, some make the mistake of saying, saying to God, me first, and then they say no. They'll say, I can't afford that, God. I'll serve you later, God, while I do what I want to do. After all, you are a God of grace. Very true. Some don't respond to God at all. But they talk about him. God will forgive me later, they say. God would never want me to be upset or uncomfortable or to go without. God's not going to judge me. Or, the other end of the extreme, only God can judge me. Like I said, some ignore him completely. They'll say he doesn't exist. They'll say, I believe in science. having a flashback of one of my roommates from freshman year who falls into that category. And we've engaged a little bit. Thing is, there's nothing I can tell him that he hasn't already heard. Something, took, something happened in his heart. Something happened in his heart. I don't know what. I know that it didn't involve him saying yes to God. Number one, if you're looking for an outline today, say yes to God's instructions Say yes to God's instructions and say yes no matter what. Say yes no matter what. Go back to our widow lady for just a moment. You, you, if you don't know this story, again, I don't know how you missed it in Old Testament survey, but she does it. She feeds Elijah. She gives him, she makes a little, little bread for him first. In verse 13, um, Elijah actually encourages her a little bit. See, see, it's very likely that she knew who he was. I, I mean, if he had access to the king, he's high profile. If he called upon, or if he was the messenger of God that led to a, in their eyes, global famine, I mean, national famine, to be fair, but a famine that was leading to the societal unraveling to where people are in the streets just scraping together the bits and they've given up all hope to where they're just going to die, that's a societal unraveling. And he was the one who called it? Chances are, they not only knew who he was, but his name was probably not a very popular name. This was probably a curse word. You don't want to talk about Elijah. He's bad news. And now he's asking me to feed him? You have got to be kidding me. Elijah encourages her a little bit. He says, don't, she, he says, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be enough flour and oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. She did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised Elijah. Do you, do you realize what just happened here? She just got a never-ending jar of oil and flour. 
like they were eating from it, but like let's just use our imaginations for just a minute. Can, those of you that have done any kind of ministry or, or, or you have any kind of compassion for the, for the poor and the hungry in our own society, what, wh- how big a deal is it to that group to have food security? Those of you who see yourselves operating in a compassion ministry down the road, you've often probably thought about how, how ways that we can create food security for those here in our own community, because it exists. Uh, during quarantine, I was driving DoorDash, mostly because I just needed to get out of the house. Like, what's essential? Are preachers essential? Nope, stay home. You're locked down. Oh, can I deliver food? Yes, you can deliver food. And I found myself going to neighborhoods in Springfield that I didn't know existed. I found myself knocking on doors. I didn't realize people lived that way in this town. One family, I carried their food in. They uh, were part of a government assistance program, and, and Walmart had me delivering their food. What I can only guess is for free, no furniture in the, in the house, right here in town, on the south side, actually, in, my, in Kickapoo School District. Those of you from Springfield, you know what that means. Carrying their food in, not a, not, no furniture. There were two lawn chairs. What I can only presume was a single mom, a teenage son, and a toddler. So this government program is is giving them the food that they need. I don't know if that's food security or not, but you can imagine what it was like for this family to get a supernatural source of food security. What a big deal that would have been to them. This single mom all of a sudden going, I know how I'm going to feed my kids in the future. I'm a parent of four. I've got four kids. Some of you maybe had moments growing up like that, or, or you know what it's like back home. The, the, the food security was a big deal, but this was a supernatural resource. Some of you are entrepreneurs, and you're thinking what maybe she was thinking. Oh, I've got a little extra today. Maybe I can trade it for something else that I need. Maybe, maybe this is a, a, a source of income. This was miraculous provision to a single mom had she said no, would have sealed her death. But on the other side of it was supernatural blessing that only came when she said yes. I don't know about you, but I can't get by on my own provision. I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. My sneakers aren't cool enough. I don't know the right thing to say when I get up to preach. I don't have a high enough advanced degree to perform at the level that society says I need to perform at. However, I have said yes to a supernatural creator who is limitless in his creativity. And for your generation, it's going to be that creativity that ushers in the next great awakening in society. It's going to come. It's going to come through your creativity. As a member of Generation X, I see it as my role to help lead your generation. And I'll stay out of of the way as much as I need to. Because I know how frustrating it is to have a micromanager. (laughs) Say yes to God's instructions. Say yes no matter what. I already said this, but it bears repeating. Saying yes to God is a matter of life and death. All right, two more thoughts, and then we're going to wrap it up. Musicians, you can come on up. Say yes to God's business. Say yes to God's business. Take care of God's business first. Let me say that one more time. Take care of God's business first. You're like, well, I'm not called to ministry, Josh. I'm, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to be salt and light in another venue. Listen, I said the same things when I was a student. I, my plan was, to, well, it, it, won't ma- it, it won't mean much to you now, but... My plan was to go into the entertainment industry. Like, I was going to go knock on the door at, (laughs) again, this is the part that won't mean much to you. I'm going to go knock on the door at MTV, which anybody who is of a certain age remembers that that's where we used to get our music. (laughs) I'll I'll be salt and light there. And God was saying, I need you to say yes to me first. I need you to say yes to my business first. For some of you, it's the business in your own heart. You're checking a box by being in chapel. Maybe some of you check a box by studying the Bible. That's awesome. Cool. But is there something personal that God's saying, hey, that's, that's all good and all, but I need you to clean house a little bit in your own heart and in your own life, in your own relationships. Say yes to God's business first. Remember the words of Elijah. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said. 
Only make a little bread for me first. Do a little something for God first. Because he's not asking for, he's not asking for more than you can do. And the exchange is supernatural blessing. And then the last thought is this. You guys can begin to play. In fact, I would, I would say please do. Um, say yes to God's supernatural blessing. Here's a thought for you. And um, you can push back on this one in your mind if you want. But provision is guaranteed. But blessing is conditional. Provision is guaranteed. But blessing is conditional. In verse 14, it says, For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, there will, be, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers. But what if she'd said no? In Genesis, Jacob received a blessing that should have been given to Esau because supernatural blessing is not guaranteed. Not even the birthright. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says this, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray and seek my face, will turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Because blessing is conditional. It's not guaranteed. Did you hear the big if in that one? James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Almost the exact same verse, two other places in the New Testament. Being honored by God is not guaranteed. The supernatural blessing of God is not guaranteed. You're like, well, I, I thought God blesses always. Yes, he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. There will be blessings that people will receive even for being super wicked. Because taking another breath is a blessing. Because he loves everyone. But I... I want to, and I'll receive that love, and that's great. But I want supernatural blessing, and I'm telling you, Gen Z, what you're being called to is going to require God's supernatural blessing. Because the solutions that our society needs, they're not going to find on Fox News, they're not going to find on CNN, they're not going to find in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, they're going to find in the supernatural revival that is coming with your generation, and we desperately need you to say yes. You are the retirement plan. It has to be a supernatural solution because this cultural tug of war that we left in the 20th century, newsflash, I know you guys already know this. Anybody my age or older, newsflash, it doesn't work. How are we gonna love our LGBTQ plus neighbors? Supernatural solutions. How are, we going to racial, how are you going to reconcile racial justice in America? Only supernatural solutions. And I'll say this as a voice from the National Office of the Assemblies of God, I am committed to linking arms with our minority leaders and our female leaders in the Assemblies of God. What are we going to do with the political unrest? I, I didn't, I don't remember, I can't think of the date right now. Is it that January thing at the Capitol, I didn't see that coming. That was scary to watch. I don't want more of that. But a lot of those people called themselves Christians. And justice is being dealt. Thankful for that. But we need more than just a legal system that serves justice. We need supernatural solutions. So I need to know this small segment of the student body at Evangel University and I know there's going to be others watching online. Will you shoulder the weight of bringing supernatural solutions to your generation and to our society? And will you say yes no matter what. Let me pray for you. I'm going to hand it back to, I'm going to let the worship team lead. Would you stand to your feet? And just, can you, can, can you just hold your hands out like this just to receive this, this prayer that I'm going to just impart to you? Like I said, I've given my entire adult life to this generation and I have high hopes. I am vested, I have skin in the game, and I need you to pick up the slack. Well, maybe another, that's, that's not the right terminology. There's Saying that there's slack implies that somebody's not doing their job. I need you to take the baton. 
and run with it. I need you to take the baton. Father, I pray right now for this portion of the student body at Evangel. Lord, for the, for the future professionals in the room, I pray that they would be salt and light. Not, not in the future, but today. Lord, Lord, for the future ministry folks that are going to be serving uh, in a professional vocational ministry capacity, Lord, I pray for a supernatural ability to say yes even before the question's asked. Lord, for, for those who will be uh, lifting up the arms of spiritual leaders, God, give them a heart for something more for this society. Uh, give them a heart for supernatural solutions, not just the solutions of bygone generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship.